Okay, um, check. Oh, welcome back, everyone. Get started. So we looked at one instance in the book of Acts, um, starting from Acts chapter 2. Now let's, uh, we're looking at Acts chapter 8, and we're talking about, um, you know, what happened in the church in Samaria, right? Um, so there were believers there, and uh, they had started following the Lord Jesus, and we read, you know, that there was great joy in that city. Um, okay, let's read from verse 12, okay? Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Okay, so um, what baptism is this? Okay, we get to know. Okay, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Okay, so. They were baptized, they believed, they baptized. This person called Simon, who is a sorcerer, and we read about him, and he himself believed, he was baptized, and he was amazed seeing the uh, signs and miracles that were done. Okay, uh, And then we, um, uh, we, we read about something happening. Okay, That is verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem, okay, so where is all this happening in? Samaria. Now, when the apostles who were there at Jerusalem heard uh, what uh, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they did something. What did they do? They sent Peter and John. Okay, so Peter and John come there to Samaria. Uh, verse fifteen: Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen uh, upon none of them. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, So this is the second time it happens. So uh, people are already believed, they've become believers, they are baptized in water, right? baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what it says, no? they were baptized. Then it talks about Simon who also believed, he was, all, everybody was baptized. right? Now in Jerusalem, the apostles heard of it, wow, okay, Samaria, people are, there's revival, people are being born again, and they sent Peter and John. So Peter and John go there and they lay hands on them and pray. What did they pray? That they might receive the Holy Spirit. You know, it says there they might receive the Holy Spirit, but we know that a person, when they believe, they have the, you know, they believe because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, they, and they have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, which, the, uh, you know, the, and the conviction of sin and everything is brought about by the Holy Spirit, right? So, so we see both those things there, that people are born again and uh, the early church insisted, okay, there's something that we need to do. We need to lay hands and pray so, so that they might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it says receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, it doesn't say receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we can conclude that, you know, it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they prayed for because something supernatural happened. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't know what it was. Okay, we don't know what it was, what was that supernatural thing which happened, but. It was so tangible, or it was so unmistakable, that this person who was a sorcerer, who was a magician, um, he looked at uh, you know Peter and John, and he said, um, "Give me this power. I'll give you this money. You give me this power, so that when I go and when I lay hands on people, they will receive the same thing. You know, they will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit." So it was very significant. It was something that was mistaken, un, um, I mean, unmistakable. Um, so certain conclusions that we can come to is this: that the disciples, you know, who waited in the upper room and who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and who and Peter, when he's speaking to the first, you know, that congregation, he's saying, you know, repent and believe that you might be saved and that you will be 
receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, he, he preached that. So this was a normal practice in the church, right? There was, it was a normal practice that people would believe, people would be baptized, and people would be prayed for that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because this is what they had been practicing, and this is what they did. The first thing they did was, OK, let's go pray. Let them be baptized. Okay, what we have received, let them also receive. Right, so this happens, and it it is significant. We see here that here also, you know, something supernatural happened. We we don't see anything like tongues or prophecy or anything mentioned here, but we can infer that it was something supernatural. Okay, there in Acts chapter two, it was praying in tongues. Here also, we can infer that we can conclude that something supernatural happened, which people, which Simon could hear, which Simon could see. So that he came to the conclusion, hey, I need this. Something happened. Right? So um, let's move on to the next one. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, instance where this happens, which is in Acts chapter 9. Okay, so we turn to the next chapter, Acts chapter 9. And this is about Saul, right? Saul who became uh, a disciple of the Lord. Okay, so Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Okay. Um, before that, Acts chapter 9 talks about how he was going to Damascus, he fell off. The animal that he was traveling on, he has this encounter. He hears the word. He has this conversation with the Lord, and and all that happened. And as he got up, he was blinded. He couldn't see, right? He couldn't see. He didn't have vision. Now, verse ten. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. He said, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise. And go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. So the Lord virtually you know, gives him the address. Go to this house called Street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For, and he's giving the name and everything, right? So he goes there. And then Ananias says, verse 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem and for and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name so he's giving a report lord i've heard about this man he's a dangerous man i heard all that he did in jerusalem now he's also come here with this authority to do the same thing here and the lord says but the Lord, you know, verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. Okay, are we looking at verse 17? And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he goes, he prays, uh, he says this, and he prays, and it says here, yeah, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was uh, strengthened, and and he receives the sight also, right? So we read this now. Did anything? Supernatural happened. We don't know, right? But we says here that he was baptized, right? And uh, we know that Paul later on, you know, talks a lot about praying in tongues, right? So praying in tongues, prophecy. In fact, all the gifts of the Spirit, he actually, you know, does a thorough teaching in uh, one Corinthians 12, 12, 13, 14. Right? It's it's all about that. Twelve and fourteen, actually. It's all about that, right? So, uh, so we know that something supernatural happened when he was baptized. Uh, well, he received his sight. There was healing. Uh, there was a miracle that happened, and also that, you know, whether it happened there or eventually, we don't know. But we know that he started praying in tongues. We know that he prophesied. We know that he ministered in power. We know that all that happened, right? Uh, signs, wonders, and everything happened. So we know that happened. So that happened as a we, we can conclude that that happened as a result of the baptism that he received, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, because Paul writes later in 1 Corinthians 14, I think he says, you know, I pray in tongues more than you all. 
like he tells the Corinthian church, you know, I pray in tongues more than you all, but in a gathering of people, I would rather speak a language that you know so that you might be edified. Right? He's talking about the proper context of tongues. So we see that. Okay, so that's the third instance, right? First instance, Acts chapter 2. Second one, Acts chapter 8, Philip in Samaria. Third one, Damascus, Saul getting filled with the Holy Spirit, Ananias going there and praying. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is the next chapter, Acts chapter 10. Okay, this is the fourth instance. And so here uh, it talks about Peter. Okay, so there is uh, Peter, and he goes to the house of Cornelius and his household. Cornelius, a uh, Roman centurion, um, and uh, he, he was a devout man, it says, that he prayed to God and so on. So the Lord speaks to him, and he's gathered his people. They are there. And uh, Peter, he's had that vision about that, you know, the whole sheet being let down. And uh, in the trance, he has that vision, and in response to that, he's also obeying, and he's come to this place. So this is what happens. Okay, Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Okay, so what is the usage here? The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. You know, where, where else did we see earlier? It says in Acts chapter Eight, for he had fallen upon none of them yet. Right? We read that, no? He had not yet fallen upon them. So they came and prayed. Um, did we see that in verse uh, chapter 8? Yeah, chapter 8, verse 16. For he had fall, he, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them, and they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were water baptized, right? The church in Samaria. So here uh, it says here, Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter. Why were they astonished? Sorry? Yeah, he, yeah, he was a Gentile. Um, they were all Gentiles. He was a Jew. They were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on all, okay, on the Gentiles. So the only condition was you believe in Jesus. Right? Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you believe in Jesus and you receive. Okay? Everyone who believed in the Lord of Jesus received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Okay? This is something similar to Acts chapter 2. They heard them speak. So the, all these Jewish people, they heard these non-Jewish people. They have received the word. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they are praying in tongues. And they heard them magnify God, which means that uh, you know, it was, they were speaking in a language that they could understand probably. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Um, and then Peter talks about, OK, uh, now these people have believed. These people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's baptize them in water. Okay, so um, so th that also answers a lot of questions. You know, should I be baptized in water? Should I receive uh, in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, that's another question. No, I've not yet been baptized in water. So how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Here, this is what happens. Right? The, these people they believe they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they were baptized in water. Okay, so. So this is what happens. So the Lord works in you know, all these ways. Right? So verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So here, the third or the fourth instance, we see that it mentions praying in tongues. That they spoke with other tongues. Okay, now we, we're going to look at one more instance. Uh, this is the fifth instance. And um, this is in Acts chapter, we go all the way to Acts chapter 19. Okay, let's turn to, turn to Acts chapter 19. Okay. So this is uh, in Ephesus. Okay. So this is uh, in, in Ephesus. And Paul is now, you know, he's, he's a believer, right? He's been ministering throughout. Uh, he's been traveling to different places. And now in Ephesus, we read about his ministering uh, and him praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So let's read um, Ephesus, sorry, uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. Okay. 19, verse 1. And it happened 
while Paul was at Corinth, that, um, sorry, Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Oh, what a strange question. And so uh, he's finding some disciples. These are people who are following the Lord. He's saying, did you receive? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Okay, And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they, they, they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard it, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now this is talking about what baptism? What baptism is it talking about? Huh? No, no, tell me, Francis. Yes, you're right. Just talking about water baptism because he's referring to the baptism with John, right? Which was water baptism. And then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, water baptism. Then, you know, let's read on. Um, then Paul's, uh, uh, when they heard of this, they were baptized. Let's look at verse 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So we see all these different, you know, uh, you know, ways and means. Like it's fallen upon them. He came upon them. He filled them. They were baptized. We see all these you know, um, different ways of which explaining the same thing, right? So the Holy Spirit came upon them, and what happened? And they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and the men were about 12 in all. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, and so on. Okay, so uh, here also something supernatural, and then it's mentioned very clearly that he laid hands, he prayed, um, uh, before that, they were baptized in water. In the name of the Lord, they prayed. He prayed, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, here we see that they, they they spoke in tongues, and also that they prophesied. Okay, so so something supernatural again happened. That they, as they were inspired by God, by the Holy Spirit, they they prophesied. They were saying, okay, maybe they are saying, "Thus says the Lord." This is what God says. Whatever you know, they were filled with the Spirit, and they did that. Okay, so we looked at how many instances now. Incidents, five, right? Um, so this is the early church. So this is what they are doing. So you see, you know, Ananias comes to, um, like um, Peter was baptized in, in the Holy Spirit. And he goes to Samaria and he ministers. He lays hands and he prays, ministers. Okay, so we read about Ananias, uh, who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, who obviously was baptized in the Holy He goes and he lays hands and Paul is baptized. Okay. Then we know Peter again in Cornelius' house. He's speaking, and people are being filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit. And now these are non-Jewish people. Everything, right? So we see here. We see Paul, who was baptized with the Holy Spirit when Ananias prayed for him. He's going and doing the same thing for the efficient church. Right? He's, he's asking them, "Okay, did you believe in the Holy? I mean, were you?" Filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? So when he, again here we know that when he when he asks the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Okay, and Peter asking the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Obviously, they are referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit or baptism in the Holy Spirit, right? So because they were followers of the Lord, like they were already disciples. Peter asks that same question to, uh, uh, you know. Uh, to the uh, Sumerian believer. No, he, he, does he ask that? Verse 8, sorry, chapter 8. Um, it says that he had fallen upon none of them. And it says that they received the Holy Spirit. So, I'm sorry, he doesn't ask a question, but uh, it's referred here that they received the Holy Spirit. But here, whereas here, Paul, he asks them directly, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Okay, so obviously, he's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, because they are all believers. Okay, so what is the conclusion that we can come to, you know, about this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Okay, what what does our takeaway? Right, several things, right? Several things that we can learn. One thing is, what is the condition, a qualification to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Anyone? 
That's it. So how many years should you have believed? Sometimes people, people say, no, you have, brother, you fast and pray one month, and then you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or, first of all, you know, you learn the scriptures, you, you first you take water baptism, and then you, and then we'll see. <laughs> and, and then we'll see whether, you know, you qualify or not. Nothing like that here. In one place, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they were water baptized. In another place, the other thing, you know, they were water baptized, they were, you know, baptized uh, by John, then baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we see all these things happen. The only qualification is that you believe in the Lord Jesus. Okay, so that's the only thing. Okay, so the second thing. So who baptizes? Really? Yeah, it's the Lord Jesus who baptizes, right? So that's the thing, you know, because uh, John very clearly said, there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay. So it's not me, it's not you, me. God, Lord might use us to pray like he did with Peter and John and you know, uh, Ananias and uh, Paul. But really, he can do it sovereignly also. Like in, in the case of Cornelius' house. The people who were gathered there, nobody went and laid hands. It was, it was a meeting like this. Peter was preaching. As they believed, as they received the word, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Sorry, yeah? Fire. Fire. Okay, what is the fire thing? No? Okay, the, the fire is the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. Like when John the Baptist explains um, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, he talks about he will baptize with the Holy Spirit with fire. And then he goes on to explain his winnowing fan is in his hand. Right? The chaff he will burn away, the wheat he will gather to the barn. So he's talking about a refining, cleansing work where the unnecessary things are cleansed or burnt away. Um, so it talks about the refining work of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, yeah. So that's that's what we see in Scripture. Maybe easier question, like you know, sometimes we talk about fire anointing and yeah, <laughs> something like that, right? Okay. So so the thing is this, you know, when um, uh, when the Spirit of God comes upon us, uh, if you if you actually there's a study about the presence of God, you know, we we read about um, Okay, the presence of God, the tangible presence of God. You know, is it? It's like fire. It's like uh, wind. It's like rain, and and so on. So, yeah, I mean, there could be to our physical senses, we could experience something, like even like a sensation, like a burning sensation, or uh, or uh, like a cloak covering us, and and so on. We need not also. Okay, so yeah, sometimes people talk about that, you know, fire anointing with. Uh, but actually, when you look at the context, it's like uh, he he will come with power. He will endure, clothe us with power, and the fire aspect of it. Well, we can tangibly, you know, we, we might, we may not. But it's talking about the cleansing work. It's talking about the refining work, where whatever is, you know, maybe our motives, attitudes, everything, things of the flesh, are being refined, cleansed by the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. And Galatians also talks about that, no? Like walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Which means even as we are led by the spirit or we make choices as we are led by the spirit, uh, that's the key to not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So talks about again the refining, cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. Uh, okay, so Sean, uh, okay, Sean, you're online today. Okay, um, Sean, Sean says, I feel that uh, one needs to have a good um, understanding of Jesus and believe um, that he died for you and then think of baptism. Sorry, Sean. Yeah, and Christ died for you. Absolutely. You know, one needs to be a believer. So that's the only qualification. One needs to be a believer, which means who's a believer? One who believes that Jesus took my sins on the cross, that he died on the cross, 
uh, he took my sins away he's uh, and now i'm born again and i want to follow jesus right? so that understanding of course not just the understanding but obedience right? i'm i'm believing god i want i want you to follow me i'm for i mean i want you to uh, be my lord i'm following you um so you know i made that decision right so that is key right so but the qualifying you know other things don't matter right how many years are you experienced believer are you a mature believer doesn't matter so that's what i'm saying so that's the that's the key thing good point sean thank you okay what else so um qualification is that you believe baptism of the holy spirit is for um the other things baptism of the holy spirit is for every believer is for all believers right so how, how can we say that what if it's only for the early church what is only who are called for full time ministry how do you say that it's for all yeah so suppose i ask you how do you say it was, it's for all maybe it's for peter and paul and because they had special calling those days um but how can you say it's for all people how how do you respond to that yeah but how, how why do you say that how do you say that okay on his sons daughters maid servants he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh okay okay um we can actually go to acts chapter 2 38 39 okay because people asked peter right uh, men and brethren what shall we do and peter's immediate response is this repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the lord jesus christ for uh, in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit so what is he talking about he's talking about the baptism of the holy spirit which he has just received right and he's saying you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit for the promise is to you your children and those who are far off okay so he's talking about him the immediate audience he's talking about those who are uh, maybe their offspring the next generation and he's talking about us actually he's saying those who are far off uh whom as many as the lord our god will call so this gift of the holy spirit is for as many as the lord our god will call it's not just for peter and paul and peter and john but it's for as many as the lord our god will call and obviously it means that those who respond to that so um so it's for it's for all okay um what other things can we learn from here So is using this? This earlier question you're talking about. Okay, if uh, Jesus came to save the whole world, then obviously the Holy Spirit also is for everyone. That's another yeah, interesting uh, yeah logic. Okay, yeah, because so Jesus is for all. Salvation is for all. Those who respond, of course. Um, therefore, baptism also is for all. yeah but then a direct verse would be this you know and also all the other examples you know like acts chapter 2 acts chapter 8 9 10 19 these were all followers only thing that we see this that they were all believers whether they were jews non jews you know that didn't matter right okay so what other lessons can we take from this what are the learnings um okay um let's see in us written something Ephesians 1 12 13 when we believe in Christ he identifies us as his own by giving the holy spirit as a seal right it's a stamp of ownership and in acts we learn about the baptism of the holy spirit yeah absolutely so uh he indwells us we are sealed by the holy spirit um that the fact that we uh, you know that that seal is um it signifies a signet ring right someone with authority would put that seal uh, saying that seal of ownership 
you know, this person belongs to me. I purchased is is mine. You know, that possession is um, is is of the Lord. So that we see, yeah, yeah. Um, so particularly to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what we looked at today. What else can we take away? What else can we learn? What else do we observe in all these five instances? OK, um, so we, we are, what we see of these early church, the be, these believers, and also the next line of leadership, like Philip and the, you know others who were there, Philip, Stephen, like they did signs and wonders, and it was by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Lord Jesus said that um, you know you will be witnesses, you will be clothed with power on high, you will be witnesses. You know, it is referring to being giving witness about Jesus with power. And when we say with power, it includes everything that the Holy Spirit would bring about through His through His power. Right? It's, it's about breaking down of sin, breaking down of bondages, breaking of addictions. It's about uh, you know releasing healing. It's about releasing words of knowledge, words of wisdom. In fact, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? They are manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, everything that we see. What are some of the gifts? You know, we're going to look at that in our next class. Um, the, we, we're looking at uh, you know gifts of uh, healing. We're looking at miracles. We're looking at uh, um, prophecy. We're looking at word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues and gift of faith. Right? Nine of them mentioned there. So all these are actually expressions, right? Manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So as disciples, they gave witness with power, with the expression of the Holy Spirit. And these are all, you know, these are expressions of his power in a person's life. Or what he wants to do or brings about change in a person's life. So these are all expressions of power. Okay, so we're giving witness with power, right? What else? What are some common things that happened when they were baptized with the Spirit? Now, five, so, five instances we saw. Out of five, we see that in three, they actually prayed in tongues. Okay, first one, we see they prayed in tongues. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 10, they prayed in tongues. Cornelius' house. Acts chapter 19, Ephesus, Paul ministry, they prayed in tongues. So these three, it's very clearly mentioned that they prayed in tongues. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, it says they prayed in tongues and prophesied. So out of five, three times they prayed in tongues. Okay. And those two times, that is Acts chapter 8 in Samaria, something supernatural happened that Simon could hear and see. And he said, you know, you please take my money. I want this. Something supernatural happened. Acts chapter, uh, uh, sorry, 9, when we read about Paul, uh, Saul, you know, we know that we could infer that there also something happened. It's not mentioned, but we could conclude that, yes, praying in tongues could have happened. Because Paul, anyway, he's, you know, he says, I prayed in tongues more than you all. He writes one whole thing, how tongues should be, you know, um, you, the gift of tongues. He writes about interpretation of tongues and so on. So which means it was part and parcel of his life, right? So we can say that in all five instances, directly three are mentioned, but indirect references, there are two. So we see that, okay, this is a common occurrence in the early church. Right? It's a common thing. Uh, and But the thing is that it is, uh, let's say, you know, all the gifts, you know, we should not restrict. Right? All the gifts are for the body of Christ. All the gifts are for the believer because the Holy Spirit is the one who's the, you know, who's the one who gives, and He's the one who indwells us. He releases. It's an expression of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Nine, uh, Nina is saying that first gift that we see in operation is the gift of tongues. Yeah, that's one thing that we see um, in common uh, in all this. Okay. So. Um, so we receive power, we receive these gifts. Um, there is a display of these gifts. And uh, 
some some questions that we might have, some common questions that we might have is this. Okay, now people might say, okay, I already have the Holy Spirit. Okay, and I believe I already received the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this, you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit? He's already in me. He's indwelling in me. He's I sealed me. Uh, you know, that's what Ephesians talks about, that I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Correct. Yeah. So, so the thing is this, you know, we uh, we come to repentance because of the work of the Holy Spirit, no doubt. And as believers, because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, we are convicted of sin. You know, we do something and then we, are, you know, earlier, maybe we just, we just didn't care. But now we are being sensitive to, uh, you know, to sin and we don't want to displease God. You know, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, right? But here we see that for the believer who has already received the Holy Spirit, uh, who has the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we see that the Lord Jesus is taking them through this outpouring or infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we see that there is a difference, and this is there for all believers. It is available for all believers. So just because we're talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that there is, you know, there is no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. See, we, we talk in natural terms, right? If I'm here, I can't be there in the dining hall. Why? Because I'm here. I'm finite. I'm here. But the Holy Spirit is not like that. He is God. Right? He indwells in each one of us. Just consider that. He indwells fully in each one of us. At the same time, He wishes to give more of Himself right, uh, upon us for a specific task, he's saying, okay, I, you, so that you can be witnesses with power. So the best way to explain this is when we look at uh, two scriptures. Okay? John chapter 4, when the Lord Jesus has a conversation with the woman at the well. John chapter 7, when he's you know, explaining. So, so let's look at both those uh, references. John chapter 4. Okay? John chapter 4, 13. Um, so this is with the woman at the well, and uh, she's saying, you know, uh, about the she's come to fill water, draw water, and and the Lord Jesus says, you know, this is what he says, verse thirteen. Jesus answered and said to her, "Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst." For the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, So he's talking about something that will happen to the person who receives that living water that he's giving. Now that will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, So let's hold that. Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Okay. John chapter 7, verse 39, On the last day and great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so we see two, two instances. He's talking about in John chapter four, 4, he's talking about a fountain. Okay, so what is a fountain? Sorry? It's a continuous flow. It's like I'm sure you've seen fountains, uh, you know, maybe in a park or something. There's water that's coming out. We can say that's an artificial fountain, but you know, there could be a spring. And the, and the quantity of water is uh, 
there's a limit to it, okay? But there's there is water coming and there is continuous flow of water. And John chapter 7, the Lord is saying, He who believes out of his heart will flow rivers. Okay, so he's talking about not just multiple things, multiple rivers. And we know, uh, you know, uh, you know, some of these rivers that you see, it can it's uncontainable, right? It's it's just so strong and just flowing and and doing a lot of things and bringing life actually and wherever the river flows, you know, it's bringing life and it's unstoppable and uh, it's so powerful. So here the Lord is saying, you know, what is the John writing? He's saying that this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those who will believe will receive. So two things: one is the fountain. So we can say, you know, about the fountain, what does John write? Uh, what does the Lord say? You know, the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So the Holy Spirit is bringing life. The Holy Spirit is ministering to the believer, right, individually, personally, right? All that is happening. And, and we can say, now it doesn't directly refer, I mean, directly mentioned there, but we can say, okay, he's talking about the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, right? Whereas in John chapter 7, it's talking about something that is flowing out of the life of the believer, it's saying out of his whole heart will flow rivers, and that river is going to affect, you know, if a river just breaks this wall and flows, it's going to affect all of us, right, sitting here. You know, this this coming is going to sweep. It's going to affect all of us. So he's saying this is he's talking about this, and he's referring to this as the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and he's saying very clearly, Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. And Jesus said the same thing, right? In fourteen John chapter fourteen, he say, "I must go to my Father, right? I must go to my Father, and then I will send the Helper." Okay. So, so two things. So we see that there is the indwelling. There is the fountain, and there is the outpouring, which is the river, which is flowing out, touching lives, touching nations, you know, ministering uh, in power to the lives of people. Right? Okay. Um, any questions? Any further questions? Okay. Um, any questions here? Okay, then another question is, what about 1 Corinthians 12? Okay, what is that baptism? Okay, so there's only one baptism, right? So, you know, what is that baptism? So we see that, um, you know, when we, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. It says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit okay so sometimes you know when we see read this verse and people might have a doubt okay uh you know we have all already been baptized okay there's no more need for baptism of the holy spirit when i believe i received the baptism what baptism i was baptized with the holy spirit in the spiritual body okay so there's no need for any more I don't know if you faced, you know, such kind of a question. You know, there's no need for me anymore. I've already been baptized. Okay, so we see that um, you know Hebrews talks about baptisms. Okay, Hebrews chapter six and verse two. If you read, um, he says, you know, um, the writer of Hebrews as he's talking about, um, uh, it's actually a rebuke there, but this is what he said. Let's quickly uh, read that Hebrews six and verse two. Okay, therefore he's saying, you know. Um, Solid food belongs to those who are of full age in the previous chapter. And then in verse uh, chapter 6, it says, Therefore, leaving the elementary discussion, um, a discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, uh, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And then he says in verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, right? So, uh, so this is the thing. See, so, you know, there are different baptisms that the scripture talks about. Okay. So, baptizo, to immerse completely. There are different baptisms, references to baptisms in scripture. So, first thing that we see is, okay, we are baptized into one body. 
into one spiritual body. We are placed in one spiritual body when we are born again. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Okay. Then we know that there is water baptism. Right? Water baptism. It's something that is symbolic. Symb symbolic of a person saying, I want to follow the Lord Jesus. Symbolic of the fact that I am dead to sin and I'm alive in Christ. Right? Um, it's a it's a it's a quiet but loud proclamation. It's an act, but it's proclaiming something very powerful. Water baptism. Then we also read about the baptism that the Lord Jesus leads a believer into, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we see that there are multiple, you know, at three references about baptism. So when a person says, you know, I'm already baptized in the spiritual body, there's no need. Well, yeah. The Holy Spirit, you know, He baptizes us, He places us in the spiritual body. That is true, that is wonderful. But we also know that there is water baptism. We also know that, you know, there's, a, there's an objective, there's a purpose for that. And we also know there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which the Lord Jesus spoke about, right? And He baptizes us and He wants to do that so that we can be witnesses with power. So we see that there are, you know, all these um, different aspects of baptism. Okay, any questions here? So we should be clear in our minds, okay? So, so because this is something that comes up again and again, and it's something that we can teach other believers. And it's so refreshing, it's so, um, you know, liberating for people to understand that, okay, wow, this is for me. It's not for, you know, a certain group of people. It's not for some, you know, special one called to minister, but this is for me, right? And uh, Satan tries to, you know, deceive and lie and hold back people from receiving the baptism of the Spirit. Because if they receive the baptism of the Spirit, they're going to be, you know, giving witness with signs and wonders. And they're going to be open to all these things right, that the Lord wants to pour out into their lives expectantly. Right? Okay. Um, okay, then the next question is, you know, why tongues? That's another thing. You know, can't I be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? Right. Can't I be a good, strong believer without praying in tongues? Okay, so let's say you're the pastor of a church, Pastor Rinchen, and somebody comes and says, Pastor, you know, I'm, I'm a good believer, you know that. Uh, can I just be a believer? You know, simple. I, I, without praying in tongues and you know, can I be baptized in the Holy Spirit? I know that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, but without praying in tongues. What do you what do you say, Rinchen? <laughs> or anyone else? St. Francis? What do you say? You know, because these are, these are real questions, right? You've been discussing, huh? In the hostel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we see that, um, you know, this is something that's fairly common. I think we have complicated it, um, you know, as a church, you know, like we studied about those, um, the dark ages, you know, the, where um, the church went into a kind of lukewarm or, you know, went into kind of nominal Christianity, those thousand years, right, 480 to 1480, and, well, a lot of things got locked in, a lot of things got left out. And praise God, the Lord is bringing back those, you know, those teachings, uh, bringing back that truth, I would say, back to the church, back to the body of praise, and bring, elevating the church to where it, where it should be, right? in terms of theology, in terms of structure, in terms of you know, faith, in, some, in terms of ministry, everything. Right? So there's a lot of restoration happening. There's a lot of reformation happening, starting from you know, 1,400. So, so the thing is this, okay, so coming back to the question, oh, we have, okay, so I need to, I think we need to wind up now, but, um, okay, think about this, okay? <laughs> so next th Thursday, we will start with the with this question, okay? Somebody remind me. <laughs> so we'll start with this question, the answer to this question, and then go on. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, everyone. God bless, take care.